My right. name is David Thompson, for those who have not, I've not yet met. And my job this afternoon is to chair the second session of this seminar and introduce the speaker for this session, Mr. Jeremy Lee. A great many people from right across Australia are well familiar with the name of Jeremy Lee and even in fact with the sound of his voice because in recent years there's a phenomenon been taking place at the grassroots of Australian politics and that phenomenon has much to do with the use of some of the new technology like for example the uh, adaptation and use of the videotape and it's been quite incredible to watch the progress on cassette tape of Jeremy Lee's addresses around this country and I don't believe there's anyone now who can say where the copy of that address that he gave back in March this year, the New World Order and the breakdown of Australian agriculture, where it eventually finished up. There were thousands upon thousands of that tape copied and sent to all corners of the country and in fact overseas. And if for some reason you haven't heard it or you want extra copies, then you'll have to consult the people who run the tape service at the side there because there are plenty of that tape remaining and they are available today. Jeremy first came to Australia with his family from East Africa, in fact from Kenya, I understand in 1962 and settled in the little town of Harvey in the southwest of Western Australia. And just by chance, or perhaps it was something else, they settled alongside, or not very far from, a man called Steve Clegg and his wife Stella. And Steve Clegg was one of those strange people that had a library of the most unusual books always had a pamphlet in his back pocket or even a cassette tape himself because he was one of the pioneers of the use of the cassette tape and it didn't take Steve Clegg too long or the late Steve Clegg as he is now you probably recall I mentioned last night that Steve's no longer with us it didn't take him long to find this young white East African that had just turned up as some kind of a refugee from a country that was obviously and literally flying apart before his eyes. And it was Steve Clegg who somehow managed to spark an interest in the Lee family about some of the things that were happening in the world. And it was Steve Clegg that invited Jeremy Lee to a meeting in Harvey sometime after they'd arrived to hear a man called Butler speak. And as Jeremy recounts the story, it wasn't until he heard Eric speak on the events in southern Africa and Africa as a whole that he started to realise what was happening to his own country and why in fact he was forced to flee as a, as a refugee from that part of the world to another part of the world that he thought was going to provide some sort of refuge and safety for his family. And I suppose it was at about that time that he realised that things in this country were rapidly falling apart as well. And I don't know what moved in his mind or, or in his spirit to respond to that, and I suppose only he can say. But it's sufficient to say that from that point on, his opposition to this whole concept of totalitarianism, if we can sum it up that way, has not endeared him to the Australian establishment or society certainly not to the media, certainly not in those political circles which he eventually did move and so it has to be said that without the aid of the mass media, without the aid of a university degree, without the aid of the popular medium by which people become famous, this man is rapidly becoming if he has not already become a household word in Australia. And it seems to me that He's incapable of turning his back on the gradual erosion of, of the traditional liberties in this part of the world.
So ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, Jeremy Lee is to address the issue of the planned destruction of the federal constitution. And please don't be surprised if that means that his address is not confined to legal and constitutional matters. The Australian League of Rights has not invited him here this afternoon as a lawyer or as a constitutional expert, but as an extremely competent layman, a Christian layman, with an ability to assess the policies and the results of those policies that surround us today. So, in his address this afternoon, he will be discussing not only the destruction of the Constitution, but the reasons why that's taking place. It's axiomatic that the destruction of the Constitution is accompanied by, or perhaps even prompted by, developments both in Australia and overseas. And Jeremy will address himself to some of these developments, which consistently seem to result in the centralisation of power, not only in our country, but now on a much larger, in fact, on a global scale. And some of those policies or the general movement towards global centralisation have taken on the new term, which means almost all things to all people now, the new world order. So if you haven't yet picked it up, you will notice in the book room to one side the new book that Jeremy produced this year called The New World Order and the Destruction of Australian Industry. If you do not yet have at least two copies, then I suggest you get in there fairly quickly to pick up some of the remaining copies that are available this afternoon, because that material is material that needs to go as widely as possible throughout the country. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you to offer a very warm welcome this afternoon to Mr. Jeremy Lee. Well, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, may I start by saying what a pleasure it is to be able to come back here to Melbourne and to uh, say that it's a privilege to be able to come to this seminar, which perhaps in terms of numbers is not as big as the huge international seminars that are now held in Australia, but which in terms of its authenticity and its uh, message is certainly the most important gathering anywhere in this nation, I'm sure of that. And it's also true that the ripples that go out from this relatively small family gathering that is held each year have a much wider implication than even its critics understand. So I really do feel very privileged to be able to come back here and to see so many people that I've met before and also to see others who've come along and are concerned about what is going on. And in addition to that, my task has been made that much easier by the paper given by Mark Macclesfield, which really has very ably condensed so much of uh, the movement towards a new world order into a form that perhaps provides some foundations for what I've got to say. Now, in the course of his address, Mark referred to uh, the battle inside the Labour Party that took place over the Middle East War when Bob Hawke, with that inimitable courage of his, urged the rest of the world to fight. I see he's now doing that in Yugoslavia and is almost demanding that the United Nations send forces into that country to establish world peace, which seems to be an incredibly courageous thing to do when you've dismantled your own forces and you're urging everybody else's soldiers to get in on the act. But nevertheless, he's never lacked courage, obviously. And Bob Hawke, having gone onto the world stage, was then faced with the dilemma of the fact that he had division within the ranks of his own party right at the time that he wanted to establish this aura of invincibility and uh, national unity and to give the impression that uh, the Australian people were behind what he'd said. So he assembled the Labour Party to try and deal with this revolt that was going on. 
about whether we should have even a token number of troops in the Middle East and the argument that he used, as Mark pointed out, was, well, of course, uh, we may not like fighting in the Middle East and uh, we don't necessarily like just falling in automatically behind anything the Americans request, but the key point I want to get across to you is this is part of the New World Order. And therefore, this is an opportunity. And Mark mentioned the speech by Dr. Andrew Theophanes, which was part of a great sort of uh, a gamut of ar arguments that were raised that finally came out in the Australian in a full-page article headed why Labour would go to war for the New World Order. Some of you may have read that. The whole argument used by Bob Hawke's forces to try and produce some sullen type of unity in his own party. And of course in, the, in that they quoted from Dr. Andrew Theophanes, who said, of course, this is part of the New World Order program, and we ought to understand that, and whenever we see a situation where the United Nations is beginning to intervene and superimpose its ideals over other nations, we should welcome this and rejoice because it's part of the New World Order program that we've been committed to for so long. And he said, we have been committed to that ever since the time of Dr. Evatt. And those are the key words. This is what we've been committed to ever since the time of Dr. Evatt. Sorry to say, an awful lot of young Australians know very little about Dr. Evatt. But he was the first president of the United Nations, the man who'd been the Attorney General during the war and the la la leader of the Labour Party. And basically what Dr. Evatt contributed into the unfolding Australian situation was a mechanism to try and overturn the Australian Constitution. And that's my topic. And therefore, basically what we're concerned with is this document, which uh, according to a polls that are now being run in Australia, 70% of people have never heard of. Now that is about 40 odd percent of the older people in Australia, but if you bring in the younger people, that is those under the age of about 27, 28 now, the total figure is that over 70% have never heard of this document and know nothing about it. Which seems to be awful to me because of all the legal documents, this is the most important. This, if you like, is the birth certificate of the nation. Now, a birth certificate is simply a record of uh, in a family situation of the forebears and the, the uh, nature of the birth of a new individual. And so it is in the case of a nation. At the time that the Australian nation was born, at the beginning of this century, this document was thrashed out after a tremendous amount of debate, which recorded not only the heritage of all that history which was injected into the Australia of the future, but the peculiarities of our own geography, which ended up in a unique document. It's the Birth certific Certificate of Australia. And it starts with a very simple proposition that this country does not belong to any power in the secular sense in the world except the Australian people. They are the rightful heirs, if you like, and owners of this country. And so when you open it up, it starts with the words, whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, and Tasmania is the actual wording. And immediately you notice that West Australia is not included in the actual list. Because at the time of Federation, there was such reluctance about ceding any sort of power to a central government in that part of the world, which incidentally was shared by the other states, that for a very short while West Australia did not join and came in shortly afterwards. So although obviously the Constitution covers West Australia, they're not actually mentioned in the wording. And then it goes on to include a phrase which reads as follows, whereas the people of these various states, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown and under the Constitution hereby established. Pretty simple stuff. 
Now, that phrase, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, was largely the result of the people of South Australia because the previous final draft to the one that is now the Constitution did not include those words, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God. And if you go back and have a look at it, the delegate from South Australia at the last Constitutional Convention made the point that he was getting so much pressure and so many requests from citizens that if there was to be a unique document, a definitive document, dealing with the very nature and core of the society itself, there should be some reference to the source of power and freedom and authority, who is Almighty God. So when the Constitution was finally voted on, those words were included. That's how it got in there. And I might tell you that that campaign to get the inclusion of those words was not a denominational campaign. True, there were both Catholics and Protestants who may well have disagreed on a large number of theological points, but it was just the ordinary people more than anybody else who felt we needed some reference to God. And then it goes on in very simple English to set out the nature of this new nation that had come together and had launched itself onto the seas of the 20th century. And it uh, was written in simple, simple English. I heard a, a speech not all that long ago by um, the professor of law at Queensland University, the man who started the whole argument about citizens initiated referenda going, in which he said that one of the beauties of the Constitution was how simply and effectively it was written compared with the modern legal jargon that we get as an excuse for law which in many cases even those who drafted it don't understand, let alone the politicians or the people under whom it, on whom it is imposed. And so it sets out, this shall be the Parliament of Australia. Three parts to it, an upper house, a lower house, and a, constitu and a crown, each with its particular role. And it then went on to spell out the role of the various component parts of this Parliament. This is the purpose of the House of Representatives, and this is the purpose of the Senate, and then part of the Parliament is the Crown, which is not of itself a law-making body, although it has the sanction over the laws that are drafted. In other words, traditionally, the laws may not become effective without the Crown's signature. But the laws themselves are not devised by the Crown, they're devised through the parliamentary process in the lower and upper house. So there is a sort of unique three-pronged stool, if you like, which we call our parliament. It is not just a group of people that we put into the arena and say, now you can do whatever you want for three, three years and we hope it's not too, too bad. They have to obey the law. So the parliament is defined and then we go on to define the role of the Senate and the role of the Crown. And the role of the Crown is very interesting because it is not, as is so often um, suggested today, a body whose role could simply be transferred to that of a president, so often s stressed or claimed by the Republicans. For example, the Crown, if you don't know this, is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The Crown has got a number of unique powers, which are that it may sack politicians from office. It may convene the Parliament. It may withhold laws from operating. And the strength of its role is that it is, or should be, totally separate from the whims of the political machine. And the great loss would be if we lost that crown that, in fact, Senator Schott is now suggesting this. We actually allow the politicians to select who the head of state is going to be. Can you imagine the creature of some of those awful people we now get in, sitting in Canberra? And they will decide who the head of state will going to be. And naturally, being high-minded, they would never select somebody who would suit their particular cause, would they? The beauty of the Crown is it's above and beyond that. And it seems a pretty fair question to me if we're going to talk about uh, eliminating, for example, the Commander-in-Chief of our Armed Forces, who do we give that power to? 
Who would you like to see as the Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of Australia? Field Marshal Paul Keating? <laughs> or Rear Admiral Malcolm Fraser, perhaps? Air Vice Marshal Bob Hawke. What a thought. Well, we can go on, can't we? You see, it's not quite as simple as they like to make out. And then it talks, it sets out quite clearly all the powers of the Crown, and then it lays out, numbered very carefully in sequence, the list of powers that shall be given to this government, which incidentally were transferred from governments that already existed in Australia long before we ever had Canberra and enumerated, this shall be the list of powers thus far and no further. And it talks about how elections shall be held and how we may select candidates to stand to represent what the people want in this dignified parliament of ours. And that is why they're called representatives. And then it goes on to speak about the judiciary and the fact that the judiciary, again, must be kept separate from the politicians. And then, finally, it goes on to lay out the way in which the people's power and control of this document is established. And it concludes with the very last segment of this document, which says, not one word of the Constitution may be altered or changed without the considered assent of the Australian people. They shall be asked directly in a referendum before we throw this away or alter it in any way because it belongs to them and the country belongs to them. And so we have a referendum in which a majority of people in a majority of states shall agree before one word of the document is changed. This makes this incredibly significant. It has unique properties, this particular constitution, the Australian constitution, which did not appear in others that came before us. The Canadians, for example, spent a long time arguing about how they should ever change their constitution. We solved that in one hit, asked the people. The amending formula was something really which was a major step forward. So this is an incredibly valuable document and it used to be taught as part of the school curricula to little children of 13 and 14. They didn't wait till they were leaving school before they learned about this. They had to be uh, competent in the way the country ran. They had to be able to write essays on what the parliament was and how the Senate was voted in and how candidates stood and they saw this as part of their own heritage. They don't learn anything of that today. There is a rather uh, desultory attempt being made in one or two schools to try and get this back in, but there's no real material because none of the parties have published anything on it. And the textbooks that were used originally have disappeared, probably burnt on the pyres that ushered in the new curricula produced by UNESCO. So really there's a huge void in which many Australians have been cut off from one of the most important documents. And this was, I believe, not something that was, uh, that was unintended. I think it was quite deliberate. All of this was basically grasped by this character in the Second World War called Dr. Evert. And Dr. Evert had tried time and time again to work out how this could be altered to suit the idea of more and more power to a central government. How could we persuade Australians to give politicians more power? Because if it couldn't be done, this was a, an insuperable barrier to a new idea that was taking its roots right throughout the world, this idea of internationalism and world government and world authorities and world law and world legislations and world religion and all that goes with it. And so he used the opportunity of the wartime crisis to try and get changes which he would never have seen through in peacetime. And he went round all the states in 1942 and he put this argument to them, our brave boys are fighting overseas. Would you agree simply to support the war effort to transfer the major bulk of your powers to Canberra for the duration of the war, that's all we wanted, so that we can support our troops overseas and then we'll give it back at the end of the war. And you know, because they were, I suppose, imbued with the idea we've got to support the troops, all the states agreed to virtually go out of business, except in a few areas, and hand their powers to Canberra for the duration of the war, with the exception 
of the smallest house in the smallest state, the upper house down in Tasmania, where they bluntly said, no, no, we're not going to transfer far, uh, powers to Canberra, whether it's on a temporary or a permanent basis, that's not on. The leader was a very famous cricketer called Joe Darling. He'd been the test captain and Everett, who thought he was a bit of a whiz on cricket, thought he'd go and talk cricket with Joe Darling, and away he went to Tasmania to get this last little obstacle out of the way before shifting power to Canberra. And he was met by a fairly indomitable Joe Darling who said to him, look, one thing about cricket, Dr. Everett, is you do not change the rules while the game's in progress. Now, he said, the rules say... The rules are written in the book itself. You know very well <coughs> there is a way in which you can change this constitution. All you have to do is have a referendum and ask the people, go and do it. And if the people say they want more power in Canberra, I'll have no objections. But do it the right way. Well, that's the last thing he wanted to do. But finally, because he couldn't overcome Little Tasmania, which incidentally was attacked fairly bitterly in the press, they were regarded as even being anti-Australian, trying to hold back the war effort. A bunch of old fuddy-duddy reactionaries who were bogged down in their own status and, and uh, conservatism. But they stood firm, and finally, in 1944, Dr. Everett had to do with what he didn't want to do, and that was to ask the Australian people directly, would you agree to what was a list of 14 powers being shifted across to Canberra? And, of course, by that time, a lot of people had woken up, including some of the opposition members, who said, no, don't allow it to happen. Well, they weren't opposition because it was a coalition government, but those who didn't like what he was talking about. Bob Menzies warned against it. A fellow called Artie Fadden, a Queenslander, was warning people, don't go for it. And so when the vote was finally taken, there was a very big no vote right throughout Australia, led by the biggest no vote of all, which was down in Tasmania. And interestingly enough, the only group of Australians who voted for that legislation, that referendum, were the troops serving overseas. And that's a very interesting point because, you see, they were in the thick of battle. They couldn't read the Sydney Morning Herald and the Melbourne Age and all these various papers in which the arguments pro and con were running. And so they only had a few minutes time to read a little newsletter put out by the Army, Australian Army Educational Service, and that particular little newsletter was edited by a young guy called Dr. Jim Cairns, who said, you know, it's a very good thing, it's going to help the war effort, everybody's behind it in Australia, so vote yes, and the actual majority voted yes overseas, not having had time to really look at it. But nevertheless, at that time, the Constitution held firm, and that is why Dr. Everett began to put more and more time into working out ways and means by which this Constitution could be emasculated or even ultimately destroyed in order to replace it with a totally new idea about how people should live in society. And he said, we're never going to get it by asking the people. We've got to go another way. And he had perceived that amongst the listed powers, in this document given to Canberra were two little words, which was that Canberra had power over external affairs. And so he thought, well, if we could only get a court that would interpret that to mean that uh, all external affairs or all treaties now give the Commonwealth the power to legislate on internal matters which previously didn't belong to us at all, the whole thing's in the bag. And so that was his main ploy. The other one was to try and get amalgamation of local government councils together, which would start taking money directly from Canberra and would replace the states over a period of time. And I might tell you, all this bun fight we've had over amalgamating councils, whether it's in Victoria or in South Australia or New South Wales, and it's now on in Queensland, had its genesis in the ideas pushed through the Fabian Society by Dr. Everett. And all sorts of phony nonsense is used. It's going to be more uh, administratively efficient to do it that way. That's got nothing to do with it. It, does, it isn't anyhow, but that's got nothing to do with it. It's a means of transferring power to Canberra. So Dr. Everett went off to the, high, to the United Nations and he worked out many international treaties in a way which he saw as valuable to this cause of world power. But, of course, 
he had passed from the scene before they ever had the chance to implement it. And it wasn't until we had this giant of a man called Gough Whitlam came in in 1972 that finally they began to actually put into place some of the things that Dr. Evatt had been talking about, which Dr. Andrew Theophilus referred to in Parliament. Now what basically Whitlam had to do was to set up the machinery to make it possible for this to happen. And it wasn't going to happen overnight. We had to bring in, first of all, a Human Rights Commission into Australia to be based on the United Nations Charter of Human Rights and all the rest of it, which would be, if you like, the Trojan horse that was used to put United Nations law in place of common law. We had to start getting judges into the High Court who might be, if you like, uh, liberal enough to translate those two words, external affairs, in the way that Everett had wanted them interpreted. So, if you like, Gough Whitlam's first task was one of setting things in motion. And he wasn't all that successful. He tried to bring a Human Rights Commission in. The guy who moved it in was Lionel Murphy, at that time Attorney General under Gough Whitlam. But the Liberal Country Party, as it used to be called, had the power in the upper house and said, no, we shouldn't allow that. It's anti-Australian and it's anti the Constitution. And if you go back and read all the arguments they used to oppose that bill, they were fundamentally sound. And finally, Gough Whitlam, after 36 months, in which he'd really wrecked everything in Australia, he'd lifted taxes from $8 billion. That was the total federal tax take at the time he got in. We're up in the hundreds now, hundreds of billions. $8 billion was total indirect and direct taxation to $17 billion in under 36 months which he began to hand out everywhere. He handed it out to nice little uh, feminist collectives or gay Mardi Gras or some sort of union arts council. But in the meantime, the meantime, industry was being wrecked because industry had gone through a tremendous crisis. Industry had gone through a huge drought at the end of the 60s and, of course, it had gone through the collapse of the wool industry as we moved into the 70s. And my own belief is the watershed which determined which way Australia was going to do occurred at that point. We'd had, that was of course at the end period of the rather dismal Liberal Country Party we had. Menzies had retired, we had, um, what, a procession of rather hopeless leaders. Harold Holt drowned unfortunately at Portsea and then we had a cowboy called John Gorton who was really a centralist. And then we had a funny little fellow called Billy McMahon who didn't really enthuse you with great enthusiasm. I think he was very earnest, but he wasn't what Mark, the great statesman of, that we expect. Somebody once described him as a Volkswagen coming towards you with the doors open. I don't know if that was very accurate. <laughs> By this time, Gough Whitlam was ready to move in. And whatever else you say about Gough Whitlam, he was an imposing speaker, a very good orator. And he managed to convince the Australian people that he had some sort of vision which we'd lost. It was a pretty phony vision, but he painted it in terms which were convincing enough to vote him in. And in 36 months, he turned the country upside down. Really had. But just before he got in, the Labour Party had promised that it would put our farming industries and incidentally other sectors of the economy back on their feet with a promise. And they'd used this, these words in their argument if I can just find them. Labour's federal rural policies, not put together by the Whitlam group, but by one of the old school Labour men who used these words. Ample proof to show that high interest rates are imposing severe burdens on export rural industries, just as they are on other sections of the community, such as young homeowners. A Labour government would investigate the overall application of interest rates as they affect primary production and productivity with the objective of providing low and reasonable interest rates to soundly based industries. And how are they going to do it? Labour's debt alleviation policies would take the form of making available long-term low interest loans to pay off immediately the crippling high interest short-term loans which many producers have been forced to accept from financial institutions and higher purchase companies. And then to try and get farmers back on their feet at the same time, a Labour government will allow a holiday period of up to five years for potentially viable farmers as regard the repayment of principal and interest, 
in order to allow farmers to strengthen their financial position. Because we need a farming sector, we're going to give the farmers five years holiday from any repayments to the bank, either of interest or of principal, in order to keep them there in place. And we're going to try and extend that to other sectors, including young homeowners. And there was good reason. Why? Because, and I know you'll find this hard to believe, interest rates were threatening to go up as far as 8%. <laughs> And then they went on the, in the latter part of this to deal with how it was going to be financed. And there was no mucking about. There's a whole section here on the use of the Commonwealth Bank. The old Commonwealth Bank, which had financed Australia at just over half a percent interest in the First World War and was started by the Labour Party as a people's bank to offset the rapacious usury of private banks, which, if unleashed, can tear a country apart. We're never going to have that, said the Labour Party. We'll have a people's bank to keep the other private banks honest. And that's what we're going to do. This was the Whitlam promise. Can you imagine taking that and giving it to Bob Hawke today and Paul Keating and saying, what about it? As we have farmers paying 27% interest. And so Australia, which had welcomed Gough Whitlam in, turned him out and in came Malcolm Fraser, which everybody, who everybody thought was the reincarnation of Bob Menzies, and we were going to go back to the good old days, and they never noticed that Malcolm Fraser actually had the machine rolling even faster. It was Malcolm Fraser that pushed through the Human Rights Commission that Lionel Murphy couldn't get through. And in order to do that, he used his party, that was the Liberals and the Nationals, to overturn all the arguments that they themselves had used to thwart Murphy. When Murphy was trying to do it, this was going to hurt the Constitution and wreck Australia and internationalize things. But you see, as soon as Fraser wanted, wanted to do it, they forgot all about that and voted the very thing in which they'd opposed. Talk about hypocrisy. And so it was the Fraser government began to put these international treaties in. It was the Fraser government put in the World Heritage legislation, which ultimately led to the Tasmanian Dam case. Malcolm Fraser spent his time running around pushing something called the Common Fund and the Integrated Programme for Commodities, part of a quite open programme of the United Nations to bring in something called the Integrated Programme for Commodities, World Control of Foodstuffs, Fibres and Minerals. UNCTAD, the United Nations Division on, tra on Trade and Development, to have 18 international commodity boards to take charge of things like meat and wool and copper and iron ore and coal and you name it virtually all the ingredients of what we call primary production in Australia to be handed across to the United Nations. And it was Fraser made the speeches. It was Fraser, he, he made a speech in Manila at a great conference they held on this issue, demanded that other nations do what Australia is doing. And in the meantime, we were in the middle of a destructive process of our own industry, which was past belief, which came out of what Mark was telling you, the Lima Declaration and subsequent documents. There's a whole series of them on this, if you want to have a look at it, which had put our industries in an impossible position. We demanded that they competed with the world on the world's terms, which I suppose is fair enough. You can't do very much else, can you? You can only take the price for your goods in the world markets that you can get. So the prices were basically stable or, if anything, dropping. But under that, we lit a bonfire, which said that everything goes up. Up goes rates, up goes taxes, up goes interest rates, up goes council rates, up goes petrol, up goes the whole tax bill, up goes sales tax. And so finally, if you're going to put all your producers, whether it's manufacturers or farmers or somebody trying to keep a bus company going or a taxi or whatever it is, in a situation where he can only take a certain level in returns, but under him is the remorseless, never-increasing baggage of costs which are driven up as, a, as part of a policy, you're going to wreck your industries. And since that time, we have written off 50% of Australia's manufacturing industries. 50%. And we have managed to eliminate an average of five farmers every single day for 30 years, which is now being speeded up, denuding whole areas, wrecking industries, 
And my own personal belief is that unless we can face this and do something to change it, we could well move from a period of massive world surpluses to genuine shortages. We've only got to compound this wreckage of industry with a few droughts and all of a sudden the figures change very rapidly. The difference between overproduction and underproduction on a world scale, you know, is marginally fairly small. It's very easy to move into periods where there's not enough to go around. Not because we can't do it, but because we've destroyed the very technology and know-how and the men and the women who've built the industries capable of meeting those needs. That's what the story of the Lima Declaration is. Talk about a program for disaster, which incidentally Australia has fo followed more enthusiastically than anybody else. And so as we got sick of as we got sick of uh, Gough Whitlam, so we got sick of Malcolm Fraser. And that's why in 1983 we turned to a different type of Labour man, a man who distanced himself as far as he could in the election from Gough Whitlam, Bob Hawke. But incidentally, before that happened, we had the production of two books. Mark referred to this book, Cooperation, which was the Soviet assessment of this New World Order program. There it is, Cooperation. Soviet viewpoint, Professor Ernest Obminsky, top communist in the, in the Kremlin. Well, he was trained in, in the Kremlin, but he wasn't working, at, incidentally, at that time in Moscow. He was working as part of a team of 400 Soviet officials in UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which was the body we were going to hand control of all our commodities over to. And there it is, as Mark said. This is the, the dream that Lenin always had. If we can persuade nations in the Western world, the capitalist nations, to be stupid enough to start handing their decision-making process out of their own shores and out of their own parliaments into international forums, that's the way that Lenin saw that ultimately we'd bring in some sort of world dictatorship. And while that was happening, Out came this little book almost at exactly the same time. The Brandt Commission Report, produced basically as the result of the Socialist International Conference in Vancouver, which was headed by Willy Brandt, the former Chancellor of West Germany, and that really is the definitive program for world government. Millions of copies. Pan Books got the contract for printing it. They had a top communist as the administrative officer who gathered the evidence the Commission would consider. Oh, and this, this shows the falsity of saying that, uh, which, which many of our ABC commentators try and resort to, you know. Um, socialism is dead against capitalism. We all know that. I mean, if Moscow's for the New World Order, capitalists would have to be against it. And yet on this commission set up by the Socialist International, headed by Willy Brandt, who's the chairman of the Socialist International, you've got a number of top bankers. Peter G. Peterson, one of the top international bankers. Catherine Graham of the Washington Post, all the fat capitalists of the world. And this book came out, and I think every politician in the world was sent his copy. The most enthusiastic endorser of this little book was Andrew Peacock. He used to go around making speeches on it everywhere. What a marvelous vision for the world. And the frightening thing is that this little book produced in Moscow, printed by Novosti Press Publishing House long before Gorbachev ever appeared, this was in the days of the Cold War, and this book from the Socialist International and from uh, Willy Brandt are identical. It's the same program. The reason we like it, said the communists, is because this fulfills Lenin's dream, which he set out in the 1920s. About a week ago, I picked up this article in the papers. This was the Financial Review. Headed, top-level talks indicate softer United States approach to Soviet aid requests which is a story in itself. But it now transpires that under Mr. Gorbachev's rather tenuous, rocky position on the knife edge in the Soviet Union, he's appointed a new, whatever it is, um, Deputy Foreign Minister for International Economic Relations, whose name is Ernest Dubinsky, the guy who wrote that little book there, 1978. Well, he's, he's not going to back off from the New World Order, is he? So that's the situation when we made the way clear for Bob Hawke. And Bob Hawke came in and simply continued with this program, the great bulk of which is aimed at so emasculating this document that it cannot hold back 
the implementation of a new world order. There are still vestiges in this document. There are still areas that have got to be cleared out of the way. There's still this awful provision that even in one area, the people of Australia should be asked about things. We've got to get rid of that sort of stuff. So when Bob Hawke came in, the program that he was going to start with was all listed in this document, Australian Labour Party 1982 platform and rules, which laid out the program. And oh, if we could only have got this to the average Labour voter. It was against everything that traditional Labour had ever stood for. Labour, in fact, had been one of the greater parties. It was more patriotic, it stood for the little man, it stood for the battler, it stood for the family, and it definitely stood for the flag. So out comes this book just a few months before Bob Hawke gets in, and there, of course, on the front cover is the Australian flag, which is part of the lie, because you open it up and there is a commitment to change the flag. <laughs> and so listed step by step through that party document is one, a commitment to an Australian republic. Didn't come out just the other day with Senator Schott, this was 1982. Commitment to changing the Australian flag, commitment to the international democratic socialist movement as presented by the Socialist International, it's written in there. Commitment to reducing the power of the Senate, commitment to reducing any independent power of action by the Governor General, which means the Crown. Commitment to the introduction of a Bill of Rights based on the UN model. Commitment to regionalisation in Australia with the amalgamation of local authorities. Commitment to the new international economic order. It's all listed in there. And that's why we've got such a mess today. Bob Hawke got in in 1983, very night that he started off. In the tally room, he'd never actually taken his seat in Parliament as the Prime Minister. He made an announcement to the nation that the Tasmanian Dam would be stopped, irrespective of what the Constitution said. And Section 100 is quite blunt. Dams belong to the states, not Canberra. You couldn't get it in clearer language. And when he was asked by Tasmania, Mr. Prime Minister, you can't do that. The, the Constitution says it's none of your business. He said, I've got, in, in essence, I've got new powers. Oh, yes. Where did you get them from? Did you get them from the Australian people to whom your loyalty should be due? No, no, I didn't get it from them. I got it from the United Nations. We signed a treaty, the World Heritage Treaty, which means I can march into the states and stop dams and cut off areas which we turn into wildernesses and stop people chopping firewood and all sorts of things. We've got down to the situation here in the state of Victoria where on some of the legislation you're bringing in, even grass species are protected and they can lock off paddocks from farmers and send bureaucrats running all over your properties. You want to see it. Talk about the ultimate bureaucratic mess. So, Tasmania said we've got to go to court. So they go to the Supreme Court of Australia, the High Court of Australia. And on that court is now sitting the man who'd been Attorney General under Whitlam, that was Lionel Murphy, waiting for this moment. And the court split right down the middle. And the Chief Justice of Australia and two fellow judges said, if this goes through, it removes any barrier to the transfer of all power to Canberra. They were as blunt as that. But four judges said, well, it's true, in essence, the Constitution doesn't allow this to happen. But, you know, international law is very progressive, and we must be seen to taking our place in the world. So by one vote, the dam was stopped. But with the stopping of the Tasmanian dam, another dam was broken, which was, which was this document, because it opened the way for all these things to come in. All these things to come in. Two years after Bob Hawke got tipped out, all of a, uh, sorry, Bob Hawke got put in, all of a sudden onto the horizon came a gentleman called Mr. Gorbachev. Do you know that we've only had Gorbachev in world affairs for six years? Seems like a lifetime. He seems to have been there so long that most people are scratching their heads to remember who his predecessor was. How many people here remember who became, who became before Gorbachev? That's right, about four or five. That's the most I've had in any audience. How intelligent you all are. 
Do you remember in 1986 full-page advertisements coming out in the Australian and the Sydney Morning Herald? I don't know whether they came out in the age. They definitely came out in those two, put in by the Soviet ambassador, in which he stated that Gorbachev was now calling for a new world order. I've got the original advertisements at home. Full-page advertisements in which Gorbachev called for a new world order and complete international cooperation, including disarmament. The man who was spending an average of 12% more each year on his own military forces was making that call. And that's really set the scene for what's happening today. Gorbachev was now pictured in the Western world as a new type of communist. He was a communist, he was a Marxist-Leninist, but he was different, he was a nice one. And so they took him to America, and they fated him right across. And you know, I saw an article on what happened when he was going to move in an aeroflot of organizers and party officials from the Soviet Union preceded him by three weeks and set up every step of his American tour. Every program, who the interviewer was going to be, almost every step he took on that. And by the time it was run, Gorbachev had been turned into the man, not of the year, but of the decade, by Time magazine. And every paper in America was running human interest stuff. And along came Razor, a charming woman. But boy, oh boy, we had five-page articles on the lipstick she wore and where she got her nylons and, and the color of her fingernails and what she did with the grandkids and how she had her hair permed and, and how she picked Gorby's tie and all this stuff. It was just blurb, really. But by the time it had gone and played through program after program, a poll run in the United States showed Gorbachev was more popular than the president himself. And he then went from there to the United Nations where he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, while back at home the tanks were still moving in on, on his own people. But you see, all that stuff was not for the, for the people behind the Iron Curtain, it was for the people out here. And we just went bananas. Oh, thank goodness. World peace at last. This man, he might be a Marxist-Leninist, but really he's an apostle, an apostle of peace. We all thought that, didn't we? But you see, the people who took it seriously were the people behind the Iron Curtain. They began to believe this stuff. You mean freedom? You mean we're going to have freedom and choice? Yes. And look at it now. Look at it now. Finally, those people have reached out for a freedom which Gorbachev, I don't believe, intended them to have. Certainly not in the measure they've got. And so Gorbachev, in the end, was scuttling between home base and the West to find if he could get enough money to prop up this thing so he could keep control. And really, you know, preceding the coup, it was just story after story of Gorbachev visiting the G7 and Gorbachev wanting $350 billion American to, for a five-year program. And every time he'd go back home, the hard-line, grim-faced, stone-faced communists would say, have you brought the money? <laughs> oh, not this time. Not this time. We've got to go back again. And in the meantime, the people are saying more freedom. And a guy called Boris Yeltsin has picked up the material that Solzhenitsyn put in. And in the end, you know, the people, whether it's temporary or permanent, I don't know, let's pray that they can consolidate what they've got. They have triumphed over that evil tyranny. And the power is being broken up, and it has set that world program back a long way. They're hoping they can mop it up. Do you know that Bush refused to recognize those little captive nations breaking away long after everybody else had done it? Because there was only one real question. It came out from one of the Treasury officials in an official statement in the United States. We've got to have central control of the economy in Moscow, really not because of freedom, but because we want to know who's going to pay the money back. And so we got control of that thing. And the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are based in Moscow now, trying to devise some sort of program which will keep central control at least of the economy. And in the meantime, we are being driven remorselessly in case any of the ideas now developing in the Soviet Union about decentralizing power actually began to sort of register in the Western world. And people out here begin to think that we might do the same thing. We might even make local decisions. And the way you drive that through is you create economic crisis. Economic crisis, I don't believe, is incidental at all. It is part of the program.
And when you walk around Australia now, or drive around Australia and see what we're doing to our industries, it is criminal, crazy stuff. Just before I came down, a little factory closed its doors in Brisbane, been producing glass, glass manufacturing industry, technically right up to date, closed its doors, not because it can't produce glass or produce it well, but because we're now importing huge quantities of glass from communist China. So out go a whole host of workers and that factory's closed its doors. I don't know whether you know it, but running from Lismore in New South Wales, right up the eastern seaboard of Australia, north of uh, Cairns, right up to Mosman, we've got one of the most efficient cane growing areas in the world. Everything in place, all the infrastructure, those marvellous little puffing billies that cart the sugar in and out, they've been there for, since, since before the war. The great mills that have refined that sugar. Why? Because the price of sugar has dropped to half of what it was last year, and last year it was exactly on production cost levels. No profit at all. And that has been compounded at a time when all our cane producers are reeling backwards. It's been compounded by the fact that we're now importing sugar into Australia for the first time, coming in from Thailand and probably other parts of the world. Or this factory that opened in your city of Melbourne just the other day in the environment, Suntory, did you read about it? Very big factory is opened, everybody heralded it, snipped the ribbons, because it's now taking Australian produce, rice, meat, vegetables, dehydrating it, put, putting it in package form, specifically designed for the Japanese market. Japanese love it, it's beginning to pour food back there. The people who work in it are Australians, the people who built that factory are Australians. There is not one cent of Australian equity in that factory, it's all Japanese owned. Are we mad? Our pig producers is going up backwards. Why? Huge quantities of pork coming in from Canada and coming in from the Northern Hemisphere. That's from the Netherlands and other areas. I stayed the other day with the biggest potato producer up on the Atherton Tableland. Best crop he'd ever had, very efficient production, and he said the price of potatoes has dropped from $15 a, ton, a, a bag last year down to $8. And he said 16 is my production cost. I'm going up backwards. I don't even know if I'll be here next year. Why? Because of huge imports of potatoes coming into this country. I've just been on the Murray, the citrus producers. There was a big statement from the uh, chairman of the Berry Cooperative. He said the imports of citrus into this country are killing an industry we've had for a hundred years. And he said it's being killed. I've just been over to Brazil and he said, I've seen a citrus industry which would dwarf Australia's, all built out of soft loans from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. No interest, long periods without repayment, and they can dump citrus right around the world while our people go out bankrupt. And I remember a story that the poor guy who's in court at the moment, Joe Jelke Peterson, once told in a public meeting in Toowoomba after he'd been across to Korea and he'd seen their shipbuilding industry there. He was a great believer in hard work. He could work your way out of anything, said old Joe. He said, if only Australians would work like the Korean people. And they took him to see the shipbuilding industry. And he, he said they were actually building super tankers on dry land, hadn't even got docks for them built. And he said, I asked these Koreans, how do they stop the ships falling over as you build them? Oh, Mr. Premier, we build two side by side and we weld them all together the, all the way up and then we actually float them by cutting the whole foreshore away and out go these giant ships into the bay and then we get a team on board and we cut them in half. Oh, he said, if Australians did that, we'd be back on top. And somebody said, Mr. Premier, how did they get those industries? I don't know, I, I don't know, he said. But if you go and look at the figures, they finance that from soft loans from the IDA, International Development Association of the United Nations, and the money in that kitty goes in from countries like Australia, out of our taxes. So we tax ourselves up to here, and we put the money in the kitty, and it's relent to South Korea or any nation with third world status on seven years no repayment and no interest whatsoever. So they go out with millions of dollars in their pockets and they buy up the most modern steel equipment in the world. Better than we can do here in Australia. We can't afford to update now. And they put it in and they've now got seven years before they got one repayment to flood the place with sheep, uh, uh, cheap steel, with ships, with any type of steel commodity and take over those world markets before we can recover or anybody else can recover.
And somebody said to Joe Jolga Peterson, what were you doing over there, Mr. Premier? Oh, he said, I was over there seeing if we can get Korean investment back into Queensland to get us back on our feet. So we cripple our own industries, taxes up to here, wages up to here, costs up to here, take the money, give it away virtually to third world countries, and then we send our politicians over seeing if we can get foreign investment back from countries like that. It's crazy stuff. So crazy that it's, it's, it's a deliberate policy. Little clothing manufacturer closed the other day. Well, hundreds of them have gone out. He said the stuff we're now importing from overseas, the finished article is cheaper than the cloth that I start with before I start making the garment. So 156 workers went out on the rail queues. And the most obscene of the whole lot was a protest in the pineapple industry the other day up north of Queensland on the Sunshine Coast, north of Brisbane, where all the pineapple producers, and they're very efficient, got together with the Golden Circle factory, protesting at the huge imports of dumped uh, pineapples, and up goes the new minister for primary industry, if you please, a gentleman called Simon Crean. What's he famous for? A lifetime spent in the trade union movement, and he's also built the Pacific Basin Trade Union Congress out there. What he'd know about farming could be written on a postage stamp. And he gets up there, and he faces the, the pineapple producers, and, and the Golden Circle factory, and his only advice was, well, I think Golden Circle ought to relocate overseas. He told them, that's the Minister for Primary Industries here in Australia. It all came out in the papers. So that is why when you go into your hardware or your supermarket or whatever it happens to be, all the stuff coming in now is made in Taiwan or Korea or Japan or India. We're even importing vehicles from India. Four-wheel drive vehicles you can buy here in Australia. Light industrial equipment, machine tools, engines, lathes. We're buying it in from Arabia. We're buying it from Middle East countries. We're buying from Latin America, even from Africa. We're buying from Israel. You name it, the stuff is pouring in stuff that we used to produce ourselves here in Australia. And as we've done this, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers go out onto the dole queue, rising up to a million people. And politicians say, well, of course, industry's got to get more efficient. That's the way to fix it all. And I'm sorry to tell you, if we have an election and we change the mob in there for the next mob, they're even worse. If you look at some of the stuff now coming out. Houston is quite blunt. Ian McLaughlin, Minister, Shadow Minister for Trade, quite blunt. We've got to remove all production from Australian industry. <coughs> And that's where we are. That's where we are at the present time. And ready to move into this crisis is this ever-present answer. We've got to internationalize the economy, integrate Australia into great blocks. We've got to accept decisions designed for us by groups like the International Monetary Fund and the OECD, and heaven is just around the corner. Don't you believe it? There is a price, but it's a very small price. And that is that we don't really have a say any longer in what goes on. We simply do as we're told. And that this ancient horse and buggy document of the past just gets thrown out. We don't really want it any longer because we've got much wiser and more far-seeing officials in world bureaucracies who will tell us what they have designed for our future. The World Order Program. But you see, there are still little bits in here that the people will cling to because they're wrapped up in superstitions of the past. You can still find Australians who believe in the Queen. The great majority. You can still find Australians who believe in the democratic process who believe that the country belongs to Australians and that politicians are our servants or ought to be. And you see, they, they present a distinct threat to all this. So you've got to write them off as fanatics and as extremists and as hate mongers and war mongers because this idea that people should have a say is really foreign to the whole idea of what is being shaped for our future. And I want to say that I believe that the future of this country still is not in the hands of those people. It's in the hands of us if we act in time. And we must start defending much more vigorously than we have hitherto.
anything which will increase the power of the people to have a say. That is why the whole of this movement for CIR is incredibly important. CIR, if you haven't come across it or heard of it or analyzed or read about it, go and have a look at it because it says the people must have a mechanism to have a say on one thing at a time. CIR is incredibly important. We've somehow got to get a movement off the ground which says no more imports of anything that we produce ourselves. We're importing $2,000 million worth of food into this country at the moment while we're driving farmers off at, at the fastest rate in our history. It's disgraceful. That should stop. And if we've got industries, let's protect them and at least make sure we don't wipe them out of existence because it is true that we cannot always compete in terms of efficiency with some of the huge economies in the world. So what? It is much more important that we at least retain some self-sufficiency in this country. Even for defense purposes, it's important. Because, you know, all of a sudden you find yourself under a threat. And if you haven't got industries which can be geared out of peacetime production into some sort of wartime production, all your resilience is gone. We need it. And last but not least, we need to give Australians the dignity of some equity in their own country, which is what we're denying our young people. We're literally promising them a country in which they have no stake at all except the right to do as they're told by somebody else. And if I was young, I wouldn't accept that. I want something that I believe in. I want a future for my children. I want a piece of dirt I can call my own. It hasn't got to be very big. I want my own roof over my own head, and I don't see that as, as too selfish or greedy. I think that is a natural birthright, or should be a birthright of Australian people, for all Australians. And let's fight and make sure we hang on to it. And that's why this group here today might not be the biggest audience in the world, but it's a good audience. Each one of you here today are incredibly important. Because what you do or what you do not do could make all the difference. If you simply pass one tape on, you've done something. If you get hold of one newspaper editor or reporter and get some truth to, through to him, it might be the straw that, that breaks the camel's back. Each one of you can do something. We can support each other, and we can build for an Australia that we really all believe in that's under attack. And last but not least, and, and this is the most important point at all, the very nature of the whole battle we're in is spiritual. It is spiritual. Because the whole of this idea has been put up before. Christ himself taken out onto that high mountain and shown the whole world, all the kingdoms of the world spread out. Latin America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Middle East. Whole things spread out in a panorama and the devil comes up and says, how would you like power over all that? You've got it. You can do anything you want. Everybody stand on your heads. Everybody face east. Everybody face west. Your haircut will be identical. Your clothes will be identical. You will sing the songs that I command. And Christ wasn't remotely interested in that sort of power. He was interested in the component parts, the individual, each person, not as part of a mass, but as a unique creation, different from any other creation in the human species, even down to the marks on your fingernails and the way you look and the way you think and your talents and all that complex of genetic factors that have made you different from anybody else. Christ was interested in that because it was his creation and how you used it and how you developed. And it seems a pretty fair question. If, if he rejected that, who would he trust to run the world? What bureaucrat do you believe could sit in Unctad today with a computer mapping out the whole of the world's dairy industry? He's probably even got a little dot for every cow. How much milk? We'll measure it in quantum terms. We'll produce statistics. And you took him outside that and showed him a cow, he wouldn't even know how to milk it. <laughs> but he's going to map the world out. What would you, who would you trust to run the world and give us peace on earth, goodwill towards men? Farcical. Who's going to be the first world president? Dame Edna Everidge. <laughs> Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser. It's all ridiculous. I'd just like to finish by saying in the last 18 months I have never seen such a change as I've seen in Australia. There is something happening. There is something happening. There is a new spirit just beginning to develop. Pray God it moves in time. <laughs>
It's coming to grips with things. We're beginning to produce leaders. There are men standing up who are saying, I am prepared to serve my... Barry Tattersall is incredibly important because the lead he is giving is going to inspire others, you know, in other areas to do the same thing. For the first time, we've got an understanding between city and country that this is a problem we're all sharing in together. Over on the Air Peninsula, some of the work that Jim Cronin has done has united farmers and trade unionists, can you believe it, in Australia, working together on a cause. And they're beginning to confront the moneylenders in the temple. And the bank managers are reeling backwards, I might tell you. There are things happening right across Australia. All right, we haven't got every resource that's going, but we're beginning to learn one from another. There's a team developing. And one of the pioneers in that development is the Australian League of Rights. Battered, bruised, attacked, vilified, knocked around. But it's still there, and it's going to be there when all the others have gone, I reckon. So if it's new to you, and you haven't come across it before, have a deeper look. Don't listen to what they're saying on the ABC, because you get the wrong slant. Have a look at its books, get some tapes, talk to some of the people who are in it, you'll find they're quite human. I've met the odd human there. <laughs> They've got hopes and dreams. They bleed when they're cut, as Shakespeare said. And they're real Australians. Thank you very much.